tech, travel, and talent. Um, so we are going to talk about all three of those things. So to get us started, I am curious, what brought you all to this particular work of diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and belonging? What was your trajectory? Andrew, I'll start with you. Uh, high school. Uh, so uh, in high school, I was part of a uh, program called AVID. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the AVID program, uh, Advanced Equity and Individual Determination. I started in San Diego. I was a student in San Diego, but it was a program that focused on uh, targeted students who historically had not gone to college or been successful in college and gave them extra tutoring uh, and study skills to go along that way. Uh, and then in college, I was uh, a part of a program called Inroads, um, which helped connect me to my first internship, um, corporate internship at, at Deloitte. Um, and so through these experiences, I began to see how there were particular programs that were targeting populations who historically hadn't had as much or equitable access to, to opportunity. Um, and so when I kind of look in some of the organizations I was, I was involved in once I was at Deloitte, the National Association of Black Accountants, uh, Alpha, other organizations that, again, were looking at how do we connect talent uh, to, to opportunity um, and why are there barriers to, to opportunity um, so, through that lens, uh, I, I began to think about my study abroad experience and opportunity um, and why there weren't more students who looked like me. Um, and that's what began the journey to diversity abroad and now that we're underway. And, and a fairly uh, similar story for myself, uh, but it actually comes from my parents. I was afforded the opportunity to actually grow up in three different neighborhoods in the Chicagoland area. Um, from the south side of Chicago, the Auburn Gresham area, uh, a near west suburb called Justice, where um, from a racial or social economic standpoint, um, it was very diverse, but from an actual income standpoint, it was you know working class, maybe even working poor. And then after uh, a few instances as a teenager, maybe the best way to say it, um, my last two years of high school were, were in the western suburbs of Chicago, which is fairly affluent and mostly a Caucasian um, uh, population. So during my formative years, um, my parents really gave me a foundation of race. And I was able to see that there were differences between communities, not only in race, but in, in culture and social economic and how things were approached. And all of that bled into not just how we lived and interacted as kids, but you know, things that we had access to, food, um, how we saw and how we processed the world. And so as I matriculated into uh, undergraduate as a, as a first generation college student and ultimately a graduate, it really just made me gravitate more towards students that weren't like me and how much I actually learned from just sitting and having conversations. And it really sparked a level of curiosity. So that was the uh, impetus, if you will. And then ultimately, uh, I was a student in China for five years at Tsinghua University, which was a completely uh, transformational experience um, that helped to set the foundation of just why this is so important and really have how, why it has to be ingrained in my everyday life. So both of you have mentioned the importance, not just of community, but also programs that you participated in sort of these structures that were able to facilitate some of, of the work that you all are doing now and the experiences of being in China and in Spain. I'm curious, how had, have, as we're thinking about this field in particular, global ed folks who are working in this in this space, um, how, how can those programs really think about ways of really deepening these ties of inclusion and, and belonging? Um, what were some of the things that you all as participants um, I know I'm deviating from my questions that I asked them, so I'm throwing them a loop here. Um, but what were some of the things that you would have hoped to have seen in some of the programs that you participated in um, that, that could really go deeper in those areas? Sorry. Yeah, sure, uh, yeah. Uh, so I would, I would put those in two categories. I would say the programs that were intentionally aiming to serve people like me, like inroads and avids of the world, and then I think of programs like my study abroad program, uh, that was welcoming, but was not necessarily at that time. I can confidently say, not necessarily, think, not necessarily thinking through what does inclusion look like from, from this perspective. So as we as we think about the opportunities, um, I think a great uh, the term that was just used is gatekeepers. I think that the 
opportunities that we're gatekeepers to. When we talk about global education, for example, um, we, we know the value of global education. We know how it benefits uh, our, our, our students. Um, and we're the gatekeepers to these experiences in a lot of ways. So how are we thinking through, how do we ensure each student that we come in contact really has access to these opportunities? Not just access like, hey, here's a program, go on it, but how do we set it up in a way, how do we structure it, it holistically in a way that no matter what the student's background is, um, that they're supported throughout, um, and that they're able to take advantage of the, the kind of opportunities we have before us. So um, uh, programming, you know, inclusion has to be intentional. Longing has to be intentional. It doesn't just happen by chance. Um, so thinking through that, and I think as we get excited about the kind of opportunities that we have, really thinking through what does it mean for us to have a diverse group of students on our, on our programs. Um, and if we put it out there and they come, that's excellent, but are we actually really prepared to support their, their success? Um, so I think that's okay, kind of the, the, the difference between the two types of programs, those that were intentional about it from the very beginning, versus uh, those that are trying to build in And I would piggyback that with, with the same intentionality is, is vital. And I think at the, the personal level, really being able to bridge the gap of curiosity with students, right? Whether it's programmatic or whether it's an interpersonal relationship. And as everyone in the crowd knows, that's a lot of work. It takes, it's an individual conversation. Everyone is different. Uh, but it, ultimately, that's what inclusion is all about. Um, but I think putting in those metrics from a programmatic standpoint to be intentional and be able to bridge that gap and then also doing the same with our interpersonal relationships and making it um, an environment where a student is curious based on where they are, not where we think they should be. That's what a lot of um, those that have been really influential in my life were able to do. Talk, hey, what are you interested in right now? Why are you interested in those things? And or what are you struggling with? and asking those questions and then presenting opportunities and or conversations that met me where I was at that time, that's really what propelled me to push the horizon of my own experiences and say, okay, I learned a little bit here, now let me go a little bit further, right? And then it just became momentum to where, you know, trying to travel the world and living in China, living in Africa and all these other things. And then, and then you, you become this person that you never thought that you could even so Torian, this question is, is for you in part because I want to uh, draw out some of what you're talking about, especially with the sense of belonging. Yesterday, in yesterday's panel, um, the, the folks talked a lot about moving from just inclusion, and I think you both are starting to, to kind of get us to that point where we're moving into belonging. How do you develop a sense of trust? You working at a company where you're responsible for developing uh, an inclusive end environment that lets people bring their whole self to the work. Tell me a little bit about how it is that you all are conceptualizing belonging, sense of belonging, um, especially from this aspect of talent and talent management. And Absolutely. Uh, so for me, I, I always try to find the center, right? So I believe that like, even when we talk about, let's just say black or white or right or left, you know, but if, just for the sake of, of racially, right, we'll say black or white. Ultimately, we're talking about identity and how a person identifies. So instead of it being polarizing, and my approach being polarizing, it's always about a spectrum because people have many different ways to identify. And so if I'm always trying to find the center, I'm looking for commonality, uh, backgrounds, maybe it's, we're not in the same fraternity, but we're in a fraternity, right? Ways in which we can connect in that way that really, get people's guard to be back down a little bit, but really it's a relational thing, right? Ways in which to relate. And so what we're doing is building that into our metrics. We're building that into our leadership development programs, into our board and our you know senior level way in which we're identifying talent, we're developing talent within the organization, is focusing on those and saying, okay, now that we found this common ground, how do we make sure that we fix the edges so that everyone has that feeling of, of belonging and, 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 and is in a centered place. Now that's challenging to do, and I would argue, especially in, in the environment that we're in today, because things are very polarizing. Um, you know, I've, I've had meetings 
um, where it's like, well, we don't want this group of people in this meeting, and we don't want that group of people in a meeting. And I, I said, you know, I never want to try to create or foster an environment where those who have felt bullied now are bullying others. And that's a hard conversation to have because there could be a power dynamic that's there. Um, and just, you know, ultimately trying to find that sense personally and programmatically. And it, it, it's difficult, uh, but I think as the more we're being intentional with it, that's how we were able to be able to create that and drive it forward. And Andrew, I know that you've thought about this a lot, particularly with your recent launch of Includify, and I'm curious how it is that you all have been thinking about making connection and how we can leverage technology in this space to make clear for those of us that we're trying to connect with uh, how to connect in that way. So in what ways are you thinking about how tech can play a role? And then I'll ask Tori the same question because I'm sure you have some thoughts on it as well. Yeah, so I mean, even going back to some of the experiences I was mentioning, programs I've been a part of, I had access to those programs because someone told me about it. And when we think of higher education, someone, I had a conversation with someone recently and uh, he made this comment that I thought was really interesting. He's like, you know, if we were starting now, 2022, and building a higher education structure um, for the US, wherever it be, he's like, there's no way we would create what we currently have. And I, and I thought that was, that was so, it was just really, really interesting in the way he's saying that. And part of that conversation was coming from, it's no, 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 none of our faults in this room. The stru these structures have been around for a long time, but they're very challenging to navigate. Uh, and so when we think about that, particularly through a DEI, DEIB lens, is on one hand, we have a tremendous amount, or increasing number of programs that are targeted towards students from uh, historically marginalized populations. Resources, I mean, we think when we think of our, our college and universities, you can think of study abroad office, there are tons of resources that are available for you. Well, multiply that by X number of offices. If you think of the intersectional nature of our identity, um, I identify as a black man, but let's say I'm also a veteran. Um, I also might be deeply religious. I might also have uh, hidden uh, uh, disabilities. There are tons of resources that are available for me. Where do I start? So it's excellent that the university has it, uh, but if I don't have access to that, do I really know, do I really, do I really feel like a sense of belonging that the institution is thinking of students like me or sharing resources for students like, like me? Um, and too often, the onus is on our students to figure out what is available for them, what programs are available, what resources are available. And we have our students, we have our students that are tenacious, they're hustlers, they'll go and they'll find every single opportunity that's there. But we have a lot of students that they're commuting, they're parents, they're working full time, whatever it might be, and we put the onus on them to figure out what's available. So uh, this mindset was, for, for us, was what we had in mind when we began to develop and includify uh, and being a, a tool that would aggregate the different resources that are available for students on campus and make it very easy for, to target those resources to students. So when Lily comes to campus and she says, hey, this is a way that I identify what's available for me. <laughs> Torian does the same thing. Drew does the same thing. I'm Drew. Everyone calls me. My friends call me Drew. Andrew does the same thing. And it's going to look different for each of us because the resources, the programs, the support that we need to help us be successful interpersonally, academically, position us a thrive post, post degree is gonna be unique. Uh, but how do we do that in a way that, uh, that makes sense for, for students, that makes sense for, for the institution? So we look at technology as, uh, as a tool. Um, I, I, I don't think technology by any means, in this sense, replaces people, doesn't replace advisors, peer mentors, or, or otherwise. We look at top technology as a tool that can make sense of what's uh, available for, for students, um, make sense to them, and ease accessibility uh, so that the work that we're doing, um, that it has that kind of impact. I'm just, there's one, one uh, final comment I'll make on this. When we began to develop it in, in, in Foodify, we were having conversations with chief technology officers um, on, on or excuse, not their CTOs or CIOs and institutions and exchanges. Um, but one of the things that, that was really, uh, wasn't lost on me, would ask, you know, your institution has invested, and I'm sure all your institutions likewise, your institution has invested in a ton of technology tools, why? And what I would always hear is some 
some combination of it helps us be more more effective, uh, more efficient, and greater impact. And that just that really stuck with me. Efficiency, effectiveness, and impact of why we invest in technology. But when we started looking at well, what kind of technology do you have for for excuse me for diverse equity and inclusion work? There was nothing. So I hear efficiency, effectiveness, impact is why we're investing in technology. But when we looked at our, our central diversity offices uh, and would ask CDOs, chief diversity officers, what are you using? It's like, oh, kind of do things over here, bring things together. So there was nothing. So I, I you know, I think when we think about the role of, of uh, why we're investing in diversity, equity, inclusion, in higher education, um, is not just so we can say, hey, we're, we have these things, but we really want them to land. We want them to have impact. And, uh, I would never say technology is a solution, but I think that technology can be a great tool in helping us be more effective with that. I agree. And, and just to piggyback that, um, try to, I'll try to use an example that, that we likely can all identify with, and that would be Amazon. So we think about what Amazon is. It's an ecosystem, right? That's essentially what Amazon is building to a point now to where they know what we like to eat, how much we like to eat it, when we eat it, what we watch, how long we watch it, right? And at the center of that ecosystem is the, the customer. And every time you make a purchase, every time you make a connection, every time you have some action within that ecosystem, the ecosystem becomes smarter and more tailored to you. So I would say that's why a platform like Clutify is so vital because we don't have that. And I'm speaking as a business practitioner who works and leads in a technical firm, and we do not have anything close to um, what we're describing here. And so I think even in our encounters with our students and our colleagues and those who are actually working in BIB, to really think about it in that way of we're engaging, where we have that individual or organization at the center, and we're really trying to connect as many dots as possible so that we can better learn about what's important and what's relevant to them. And then that's where it becomes something that is scalable and then transformational um, over time. And probably a more futuristic way, but I would say in near future, would be blockchain, right? I mean, blockchain is at the very cusp of how we will be interacting, banking, um, likely even in education over the next few decades, right? And it's a decentralized way in which we engage, but it is a shared ecosystem in which every transaction is connected to each transaction, and we all invest in and we're a part of the validity of that transaction, which makes it grow over time. So, you know, that's a real world, tangible example, I think, of where, you, of where we're going with this, but then also a more futuristic way. And so it's a way in which we can approach our interactions in the world that we're in right now as well, just thinking about that ecosystem and how it, it comes together. So tech, I think, has uh, been under fire in lots of different spaces, I, I think especially around AI and thinking about artificial intelligence in terms of our artificial intelligence reflects the information that we put into it. And at, at this point, um, connecting talent and tech together, you see what I did there? Um, as at, at this point, does not necessarily reflect the diversity of folks who may actually be using the technology. And I'm curious, as you all are thinking about talent pipelines, talent trajectories, of getting representation of different perspectives into the places and fields, you all are both in tech, how do we develop the, the students, and I, I think here, for, especially for this group, how is it that we get students to start thinking about these as options for that, and how do we connect that with their global experiences um, in that way? So um, I'm going to throw that out there and see which one likes to take it first. Don't mind. <laughs> this, this, is, this is my day to day right now, right? And I'm very passionate about this. We, maybe I won't give the exact number, but I'll say there are thousands of jobs in high tech working here in Silicon Valley that we are currently uh, looking to hire. And I'm over it. It's extremely difficult to fill those positions with diverse talent. Now, it doesn't mean that the talent is there, because we know that it is. We work with them, right? I would argue that I'm a part of that community. Um, I think one of the things that we have to do from a, a business connecting to higher education institutions is really look at it more as a long-term investment as opposed to how do we come in and start to extrapolate students right away? How are we investing in the ecosystems of the universities and the higher ed institutions that we're working with 
where we're creating incubators, where we're investing in labs, where we're actually, candidly, maybe even part of the curriculum, where students are getting real world, tangible input into what's relevant in technology today. Because it's changing at an exponential rate when you start to consider Moore's Law. Every year, the computing power of our processors is doubling, if not tripling, when you talk about some of the larger organizations. So that means the skills that it's going to take is not based in you know, programming from 10 years ago. It has to be programming that's 2020, 2021, over the, next 30, over the last 36 months. Um, so I think that's number one from a, a, a business institution standpoint. Um, now, when it comes to students in higher education institutions, one of the things that I'm driving and with our board and with some of the clients that I have and work with as coaches is it's not really about always having technical skills per se, but it's also about having a technical mindset. So if I'm an English major, right, and I'm applying to a large technical organization for um, a data analytics role, the question is how do I bridge the gap between that classroom knowledge of English and having a technical mindset to be able to solve problems, collaborate, and be able to formulate that in an agile way, right? In a way in which we can say, we have this issue, we have a team with limited resources and limited information. Now we need to come together in the next 36 hours and fix this one or two problems. Because that's what hiring managers, that is what recruiters, that is what large technical organizations are actually looking for. So I always encourage those that are working in higher education, maybe even to try to develop, if you have your own framework, of a technical mindset for your students. So as they're developing their resume, as they're learning how to interview, that they can do so and speak the language of the organizations that they're trying to be a part of or that are trying to actually hire them. And so I'm actually working on one that it's not even geared toward our organization, but just in general to be able to share, because that is what a lot of organizations are looking at, that technical way of thinking in which we can systematically in an agile way, solve problems, and then move on to the next thing. And that's, if you think about it, that's how Uber, right? Uh, an app that we use readily today, but it started in thousands of iterations, right? Thousands of small iterations, and it wasn't perfect. In fact, according to my ride this morning, it's not perfect now, but, 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 but it changes over time, it adapts, right? And I think that's one of the things that we have to make sure that we're doing is that we're, giving that technical mindset to students and organizations to adapt with the speed in which technology is moving, because there's a, there's a gap. There's a gap. I, it, it, two things that you, you mentioned, um, I think, adapt, well, being a technical mindset and, and, and adapt, um, and I think particularly for our field of international education, um, where we have an, an opportunity to help shape the technology of the future. So you mentioned, um, AI and some of the challenges and some of the legitimate uh, pushback and fears about the role AI will have in our, in our, in our society. When, when we think about some of the benefits um, that students, you know, education abroad, global education done right, what uh, they can gain, think about the empathy, um, being able to think, think, think about things through a different perspective. We, in, in addition to that tech, um, uh, that tech, the technical mindset also need folks who are working on the products of, of the future um, to, from the ground up, be thinking of that through the lens of how does this impact the other? How does this impact our society? I mean, I think we can all look at, uh, you know, I think there's plenty of folks we can probably call out. You, we, we don't have to do that. I think you all can probably gather maybe what, who I'm thinking of, but there are probably applications that we all use right now that arguably had they been more well thought thought out might not be as harmful to parts of our society that they are now so when we think about i mean technology is not going anywhere it's going to be more um, pervasive throughout our lives going, going forward um, when we think about who's building um, applications who's building tools um, uh, of, the, of the future um, where what kind of experiences have they had and how is that going to influence the development of what you're creating. Technology, and I mean, our, our lead developer always says, we can build anything. <laughs> and that's it, we really can build anything. Um, uh, 
per se, but how, how is it having an impact on uh, particularly our, our most marginalized populations and our folks who are building it, how they have the kind of experiences like studying abroad, entering abroad, engaging with the international students in a way that, you know, I'm gonna do this a little bit different because I can see, you know, 10 steps down the road how this might have a negative impact on these populations versus, uh, hey, this is build and break, build and break, build and break. So I think there's, I think there's a, uh, the, it's important um, as international educators for us to think about what role do the students who we're working with, what role will they have, uh, particularly in tech point for the future. Um, the other thing I'll say that is a little bit different, um, uh, so I'm not gonna go too far off, but I, I also think within higher education as a whole, as I mentioned, we use a ton of technology tools at, at our institutions. And we need to ask hard questions. Um, you know, there was a, a, a tool that uh, institutions used in a, a couple years ago where it came out where they're using AI um, to try to encourage uh, or recommend this group of students um, you know, pursue these majors, this group of students don't. Well, they were recommending that you know, black kids don't go into STEM-related fields because their chances of being successful aren't most great. Technology tool that's automating this, but what information went into that to make those kind of recommendations? So even the tools that we're currently using at our institutions, uh, we need to look through and say, I'm glad, I'm glad to do all these great things, um, but are these companies, are these firms really thinking uh, through the technology that they're using, through a DEI lens, how is it really impacting of students that we, that we have. And like the rest of society, higher education is, will probably use more tech going forward than less. Um, so it's incumbent on all of us to ask those tough questions. Um, not just think about, hey, this is gonna make my job easier, you know, very well it can, but how is this gonna impact our, our, our students and is it gonna disproportionately um, impact our most historically marginalized students? Yeah. A few things, can I add to yeah. that, please? Sure. Um, so when I think about tech, we've always had tech, right? I mean, if we think about it, the car, my, the Model T was technology I don't know, 120 years ago. Um, so that's really not going to go anywhere. It's going to accelerate, which is what we've been talking about now. I think what's really important, though, from a student standpoint, is to really have a mindset that's included in a part of that technical mindset of producing as opposed to consuming. Right, and maybe I'm putting way too much of my business hat on right now, but, but what you're talking about is who is actually at the beginning of creating products and services for a market? And you're absolutely right. I mean, I sit on AI ethics boards and there are plenty of platforms that have ridiculous amounts of bias that are built in from the very beginning. And a lot of it, candidly, is not even intentional. It's just based upon levels of experience. You don't know what you don't know, right? Or we can't be what we can't see. So um, really encouraging students to have a, a producer mindset and when they have ideas to you know, help them flush out how they're going to be able to tangibly execute some of those ideas, get and learn how to receive uh, feedback on those ideas so that potentially they are creating some of those products at the very, at the very beginning. And again, I don't want to make it um, overly business-like, but I do think it's very important to do that because the more we are part of the production process and, and being, or having more of a entrepreneurial spirit, um, the more that we have, for lack of a better term, but this is exactly what it is, control of what we are actually utilizing, so. So it's interesting, you both have mentioned a couple of things that, I, or one thread in particular that I, I think is fascinating. So technology is moving very quickly. I mean, we're on iPhone 14 now, who knows where we'll be next year, right? Um, and it's moving very fast. Higher education is not known to move very quickly. <laughs> Am I right? Am I right? So how do you kind of juxtaposition those two things, knowing that the technology, and oftentimes the technology that we're implementing in a very real time, um, is coming into a system that takes really long to respond? Um, or that takes a while for the ship to kind of turn. Um, how, this is, this is not something that I prepped you all for, so this is a new one, um, but I'm just curious, how, how do you kind of think about those two things existing and how can we as administrators and staff also advocate in our own spaces to, for the leaders to also think about how these things are, are influencing us in our, in our work, right? 
Well, I, I don't Torian know. Has I, I don't know so if it's <laughs> is politically correct, but I, I think you don't ask the system, you just challenge the system. Because no system does what it takes to cannibalize itself on this planet, right? So, so we have to say, hey, this isn't working. You know, start where we are. It could be with a group of students. It could be with a classroom. It could be with a new curriculum. It could be with a new degree that could be offered, anything, and say, okay, how can we do this, not outside of the box, but create a completely different shape, right? And this is where, in Silicon Valley, that's how they think, right? I mean, I sit in meetings right now, but literally, we're talking about how is this going to be used on Mars? Literally. I sit in meetings where we're talking about, when you walk into a room like this, where we will be able to call someone through our thought, Right? where we will be able to be marketed to real time based on other places that we've been without any device in our hand or on us, but it's a part of us. Like these things are coming, right? And when in those meetings, the people who are developing those meetings, they are not thinking within the paradigm of how do we fit this in the system of what was. They're saying we're gonna create something new. And unfortunately, if we're not at that table producing, we become the customers of what is produced. So I think that mindset starts in the classroom, right? It starts with being able to do that, and it is difficult when we are, you know, part of different systems. I worked, I worked with Pearson for about 10 years, so I'm very familiar um, with higher ed and K-12 and then working in Africa as well in the same industry. Um, but one of the things when I was working in Africa was we had to not think in a Western colonial way. That was very difficult for me because I reported into that system, but on the ground it was, okay, let's scrap all of that. How, how is this relevant where we are right now? How do we create educational products and services that are relevant to Lagos and Abuja? I was in Nigeria at the time. And then build that out so that it's scalable in context to where we are, not where it's most profitable in other places in the world. Um, I can't believe I didn't stay there that long. Not, it was, that wasn't the problem. It was the reporting that was a little bit more the problem at the time. But it was that thinking that really was able to move us forward on the ground and, and build things that were relevant and is still, still in existence today because of that mindset. So. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you, know, you talk about the system and just it's um, so interesting because <laughs> You know, it's not higher ed, it's that higher ed is a system. And it's a system that is meant to built and meant to move slow and not, not change a lot. But what you made, technology is not going to wait for higher ed. Um, technology is going to keep going. And I think we, you know, we pick up the Chronicle or other, you know, inside higher ed and so on and so forth. We know that there are, te there are technology companies that are bypassing higher ed for talent and say, we're just going to go around and find these high school kids that are great and we're going to train and develop them or we're going to find folks who had a little bit of college and didn't graduate, we're going to upskill them and we're going to bring them into our organizations. So we're seeing right now already, um, we're seeing technology starting to see in other industries that they're not going to wait for higher education. Um, so I think with within the institution, and I, you know, full disclosure, I've never worked, I, in my experience, uh, career in higher education, I've always worked higher ed adjacent, I've never worked within an institution, but having had the, I think, privilege of working with a, a, a lot of institutions and, and, and chatting with folks, you know how challenging change can be within, uh, within. Uh, but that said, I think there's opportunity for us to, a question that we can ask, in our sphere of influence, where can I do something that's out of the box? The, the example you just gave about um, you know, education products and, and, and continent uh, um, versus what it looks like in, uh, in the Western world. I think take that same concept um, with respect to international education. Um, if we're targeting a different population, can we just build something that's completely different for this population because this is going to better serve this population versus saying this is a standard of what we do, let's kind of change it around the edges a little bit, throw a scholarship there, and now we're going to get students to go on this thing we're going to do. Well, that may, that may work for a certain group of students. Let's build something that's different for another population of students. Maybe that involves technology in some way, maybe it doesn't, but um, that mindset of uh, how can we in our sphere of influence appreciate that the, the status quo does not work and the status quo is going to keep us exactly where we are and the world is moving 
much faster than that. How do we stay relevant to those who we're serving and how do we have relevant opportunities and how are they tailored towards, uh, towards particular populations? Yeah, there, there are things on the table, I'm not gonna give any names, but there are things on the table as far as hiring where it's like we're not even going to, we don't even want college degrees. We want micro degrees, we want courses that are relevant over the past 24 to 36 months. We want students who, um, you know, background in maybe, you know, AWS developments and things like that. And if you look at the demographics of students that are matriculating to colleges and universities, traditional colleges and universities, the, the, the demographic that is slowing down the most are heterosexual white men. And they're gravitating toward these micro degrees, these smaller courses, because they can go into technical companies right now, trust me, and make 140, $160,000 at 18, 19 years old, right? So we talk about the social economics of that, right? So if you come from an underrepresented community where you know, you may be going through the traditional path, which is nothing wrong with that, but there's a shift that's happening where economically, before 25, you're already up a million dollars, right? So I think that knowing things like that to say, okay, how do we integrate some of that into where we are is the kind of mindset that we can start to integrate into where we are right now. And there's another example now, stop talking. So like, so Microsoft, well, there's an organization based out of Washington. <laughs> that, <laughs> that is, that, but but the, it's brilliant though. So essentially what they're doing is they're saying, okay, we have six courses that are like the baseline courses for anyone who comes into the organization based out of Washington have to have, right? Regardless of what area they're in technically. So what we're going to do is we're gonna to go to the universities where we want to work with and recruit from and we're gonna integrate those courses as a minor so that if I'm an English or a history major at said school, I can take these six to eight courses, graduate with my degree, and then I know two institutions that they've partnered with individually to say, you're guaranteed at least one interview with said organization if you have that minor from our school. See, that's how you create a sustainable pipeline. It helps Microsoft. It's helping the universities that they're working with. Right, right. Oh, sorry, sorry, right, right. And, I, and I'm not trying to represent Microsoft, but I'm, I'm just, and this is all things that we can Google, it's public information, but these are some of the out of the box thinking and new ideas that are being tried and, and, and really solidified to see, is it going to work long term? How does it work now? And how does it create new opportunities? So just looking at things like that, I think, I think can be uh, very impactful. Just piggyback on, on sorry, sorry, really one more time. <laughs> no, but that, so I, I think particularly for the, the field of international education, um, you know, for us thinking, okay, how do, how is that applicable to us? Everyone's not going to work at a technology a technology firm, and nor nor or should they. And that's fine. But technology is going to be is already part of all of our lives. Um, and those are skills that will be in, important for us as professionals now to continue to hone, let alone for the students who we're, uh, we're working with. So knowing the trajectory of society as a whole, how are we um, integrating some of these opportunities into global programs? Um, if I'm in a location, you know, are we creating opportunities for our students to learn some of these skills through, through, uh, through global programs? be it micro-credentialing or otherwise, are those things that opportunities we have within our global office outside of the standard, let's say, study abroad program and so on and so forth. So really pushing, uh, I think, our field to say, we see where society is going and you know, higher ed lags behind a little bit, that's fine, it's always, it's always been like that. Um, but are there some things that we can do to ensure that the students who we're working with, the students where we have influence, we're positioning them for what the world is today and what the world is going to be to, to tomorrow. Um, and you know, it pushes us because it's different than what we've we traditionally have always done. Uh, but that part of, that kind of change, I think is also how we stay relevant in this uh, fast moving, fast changing environment. I think a, um, I'm sorry. Continue, sure, please. Because I, I want to share a framework and, and just, this is an idea 
that I utilize. So in the position that I'm in now, like I, I don't have a, an HR background per se. I've been working in business, I've built businesses and things like that. But again, in the position that I had, I had to say, well, how do I frame this international experience, my international education in a way that was transferable? And it's three categories that we were able to utilize personally and then we're actually looking at integrating from a business standpoint. The first is skill set, right? And I think that's pretty relevant. What are the skills that a person has, but particularly when it comes to international education that helps them differentiate from other candidates, one, and then two, gives them range to say, I'm able to have a broader foundation than another candidate, so skill set. Um, the second, which I think we don't really look at enough, whether it's in an organization or outside of the organization, are our values. A lot of people, particularly younger uh, people, can't articulate um, or haven't even started the process of saying, well, you know, what, what are some of my core values? What's most important to me? And so for me, right, for me it's curiosity, right? I've always been curious. I've told you all a little bit of the story about how I grew up. And so that translated over to wanting to go study in China without having any context for the, the language. And then also that transfers over from a work environment to, hey, I'm curious about new ways of looking at problems. Here are some examples of how that show, show, has shown up in my international education. Here are some ways in which that's shown up in my business acumen. The third would be, and I think this is really um, one of the differentiators, are attributes. And attributes would be more of um, situational awareness. These are things that we have that are more innate, can be honed but not necessarily taught, right? So core attributes that a person has, so the, the, the ability to collaborate, um, the ability to bring people together, right? And so I think if a student or a candidate is able to take those three categories of skills, values, and attributes, talk about how their international education plays into how it differentiates them as a candidate, and then give real world examples of how they can apply them into where they're trying to go. To me, that's a really good framework to be able to say, hey, here's how I'm different. Here's how my international education or studying abroad has made a difference in my life. And from an employer standpoint, because that's what employers look, look at, how these things can add more value to your organization. So thinking about it that way and being able to bring some of that to potential students, I think, could be a way to, to look at it. Excellent. Well, I've asked a lot of questions. I want to give you all some time to ask any questions that you all have. I think we have mics available around, maybe. So um, anyone, uh, any questions that you have for our colleagues here on the stage? And begin this, this table right here in front. Okay. How about it? I'll repeat your question. In, uh -huh. Okay. Hi, um, I work in virtual exchange, and so this is very relevant in talking about how technology helps us expand access, helps create this kind of environment where young people can gain these skills that you're talking about, right? One of the challenges we struggle with very often is a uniquely American one. Uh, my organization works in 37 countries, so we work in the US, Middle East, North Africa, South and Southeast Asia. Uniquely American problem that young people in the US tend not to take advantage of opportunities that are offered to them, that are offered to them for free. It would incredibly improve their employability skills, provide virtual exchange and study abroad options. And so the thing that you said about putting the onus on the students to figure out what opportunities are available to them really resonates because we don't want to do that. They already have all these things. You don't know what you don't know. So then how do we help, right? As providers of study abroad, virtual exchange, or physical exchanges, how do we improve on that like situation that we're in given the current context, given that higher education will not move very fast? How do we use technology and meet the students where they are to provide them with these opportunities, to provide them with the knowledge that they have access to these things. Uh, excellent. <laughs> excellent, excellent question. Um, I stopped eating at the Cheesecake Factory because there's too many options. You get in there and it's like an encyclopedia. I'm like, where, like, where do you start? 
And sometimes that's the case. There's so many options. Where is is overload? Like where would we start? So and the question is, how do we get the most relevant opportunities to students when and when when and where they're they're thinking about it, or maybe even before they start thinking about it, letting them know this is something that's 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 for you, or something that might be re re relevant for you. Uh, and I think that's part of what we're trying to to do for, for that exact point. They're free opportunities are very low cost opportunities that are very re very relevant to our students um, to, for their growth interpersonally, uh, academically, preparing them for their, for their careers. But all, too often it's like at a certain point where there's so many things that I don't know where to start, I'm just gonna go for that one thing that I, that I know or the person, my, my peer or my friend or my family that's mentioned something to me, I'm just gonna go for this thing because someone's talking to me about that, somebody's in my ear. Um, so I think the question for us is how can we leverage technology in a way to be in the ear of, of students and say, hey, this is a, a this is something that would be really relevant for you based on who you are, based on what you said you're interested in, this would be something that's really relevant for, for you. Versus just saying, here, you know, go search Google and, and see what you find. You know, that don't, don't, don't do that for Google. Who knows where you'll find that? Uh, <laughs> everything. But, everything. <laughs> You can find out that the world is flat I mean, if you want, if you want to. Right? Uh, so that, 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 I think that's in part what we're trying to try and trying to get at. Really thinking through. Um, we know the opportunities are there. Um, we know students have a lot on their um, on, on their on their plate. We know the students who are coming to us. We know their situations from that that perspective. So then, how do we put the onus on us and say how do we target the right opportunities to the right students? At the I have a comment, but also a question to that. Like, I know that there are a lot of challenges that come from the communities that we serve, but I'm curious some of the feedback that you are all receiving as educators and those working in higher education around the effort that it actually takes to be successful. What are you hearing from your students when it comes to that? Because, and I'm, I'm gonna set that question up with, what I found in a lot of the conversations that I have is, you know, if you are having that conversation to a student, there's a certain level of privilege to even have access to have a conversation. Because you don't really know that if you don't, if you haven't seen other things, right? If you, if you don't have a frame of reference, and it may not feel like it at the time. And so I try to explain to younger people that I'm speaking to that there's a lot of options that are out there, but let's try one thing now like what what might you be interested in where are you what do you like to watch on instagram TikTok, whatever i don't care it doesn't matter what do you like and then let's find something that could connect to it and let's again thinking from a technical mindset let's test something out for 90 days right it could be a course um it could be an area that they may want to go study okay let's do a little research about it the food, I mean, I'm making it up as I'm thinking about it now, but just really trying to make it relevant to where they are so there, there's a level of interest that's outside of saying, well, I don't have any other choices, or really, I don't have any agency, right? Because you do have some agency. Um, it may not be as much as other people, but you do have some. And so trying to really help instill that is something that I found um, helps in some places, and then in other cases, it doesn't. But that's a conversation that I try to have as, as much as I possibly can. And I do think that you can leverage technology in that way too. I mean, whether we like it or not, like short form content is uh, here and it's everywhere. I mean, YouTube has changed their strategy to it now where they have YouTube shorts. Um, um, what's the other, uh, Twitch is moving toward that, which is another platform. And this is like moving extremely fast. And so, Maybe, you know, creating a project or doing something there where they can have some fun editing, creating some content, but it's something that they're learning along the way to spark their interest could be a way to go. So, um, you know, I really just think about it from an agile standpoint and relevance, meeting them where they are, and then trying to really get them to almost systematically do something to just test it out, like an engineer would do a product. Let's see, let's see how it works. Either it works, or we learn something and we pivot. Over there. I mean, this is really amazing. 
because I'm, I'm getting way more than what I expected. Um, let's say you were given a, an innovative hub, mm -hmm. uh, a center at a university, and you were told, hey, create what you want to advance students or to advance the university. What kind of projects would you put in it? One or two. <laughs> Is this a real time challenge that you have right now? <laughs> I wasn't really. <laughs> I, I mean, I, to me, I, I, the, the word that comes to my mind is incubator um, with that. And when you think of uh, incubators in, in the tech world, is less about um, is less about the, the incubator saying, "Hey." we want you to work on these things, and it's more about, you come here, we're giving you the space for you to be creative and for you to tell us to try something. I mean, you look at, I mean, a lot of, a lot of technology, a lot of technology investing is we're gonna, you know, there's these 10 projects, we're gonna throw our money at these 10 projects. One, maybe two will be really, really one might be really, really successful, three, two or three might be somewhat successful, and the rest will probably fail. But the idea behind that is that we're just giving you the space to come in, try something that you think will work to address a certain problem. So I think if you have that at, on a campus, you think of students having a space where it's like, you come in, we're giving you the, we're kind of giving you a blank canvas and you create what you think you need because you're the end user. Um, what normally happens, in, in particularly with technology and higher education, is there's a group of professionals in the world, or sorry, in the room, talking to a group of professionals from a technology company uh, about what is good for students, and then we give it to students, and then we scratch our heads why they're not using it. And, and, and you know, when students say, hey, we're not giving the engagement we want, well, well, were they part of that decision at, at all? Were they part of creating it? Were they part of saying, this is what we want, what we need? So I think in a, in a space like that, which I think would be phenomenal for institutions to have that kind of space, um, our students are brilliant. Like they're brilliant, they're smart. They, they, this generation grew up, you know, proverbially with I, iPhones in their, in, in their hands. I mean, they've been technology from, from birth, um, which is different for, for many of us. So I, I would say in that space, create the space and then step back and allow them to, to work their magic. Yes, and I, I'll articulate that in a, in a philosophical way, which is you have to teach them that it's okay to fail early and often, right? Because that's what an incubator is, right? It's, hey, we have a group of people with resources and some ideas. What problems do we want to try to solve? And out of 25 projects, there may be one that turns into something that actually becomes tangible. But if every step of the way, they're not failing and then learning, failing and learning, and that's, that's, that's agile development. That is literally what software developers do every single day, right? And I think it's something, it's a mindset that has to be ingrained. Um, I'll throw out a shameless plug. A friend of mine, um, uh, well, black woman, um, she is in Africa. She started, her and her partners started um, Africa's first blockchain token company. It's called Mara, M-A-R-A. -A. You can get a chance to check it out. And I happened to, to be at their launch in Nairobi about a month ago. And their whole business model is just that. It's how do we create incubators throughout Africa that brings young Africans in a room where they have the resources to say, how do I build these crops? How do I make sure that we have clean water? How do we tap into the free um, resources that we have online to create our own uh, development of, for education so we can learn real-time things instead of having to um, maybe take another system from a country that was here? And that's all they do, they're just creating incubators. Now from those incubators are going to arrive some ideas and then what the company does is have investors say, ah, oh, this came about, we have something that addresses a, tollable, a total a scalable market, and then that's where resources and more funding gets poured into an actual company. But the mindset is the same. It's fail early, fail off, and then learn as you go. I just want to say the fail, I feel like we, we should all practice that as well. Because we model, I, I, seriously, I mean, with D and I in particular, there are going to be things that are going to fail. And I feel like that just 
resonates. I also just want to highlight that you brought a black woman's name into a, an unfamiliar platform, which is wonderful. So I just wanted to give that shout out. <laughs> yes, we'll take a question here and then question here, and then into the back. Um, so I wanted to circle back to your um, your previous question, Mr. Richardson, when you said like, what's the feedback we're getting about why students are what's a barrier to their success? I yeah. think you I think you answered it yourself. This idea that there's um, we're not teaching people to fail and fail often. Technology, I think especially, has um, created like a sense of a highlight reel where success is instantaneous, and students are seeking instantaneous gratification and success with a fear of failure, yes. right? They're seeing everybody else succeed. They're seeing overnight success on social media, like because of whatever, the lip gloss, the hair extension, the twerk, whatever, right? And so they're like, oh, that's gonna be me too. I mean, it's for real though, right? Like that's really what it is. And so um, I think that you answered your own question and I just wanted to bring that to your attention. <laughs> but the other thing was, um, I appreciate the advice that you both have shared about how to help students succeed, but this is a little, I guess, selfish question. How would you then, what is your advice for folks who are in this work who recognize some of these gaps but have those same barriers that our students do, right? So like specifically women of color who are in higher education, who have a personal and professional labor to tend to, our ceiling continues to come down rather than to eradicate, right? Because of the variety of things that are now systemically in place that maybe are different than previous years. And so I'm just curious, as two successful black men, like what does it mean and how do you see your counterparts succeeding? What's your advice? Okay. Okay. I, 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 so, and yeah, maybe this is not the most politically correct way of saying, I mean, I, I think for, women of color in higher education, if, I think it's okay if, if you say, hey, I love higher ed, but higher ed doesn't love me, then balance. I think that's okay. Yeah, and, 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 and I think we've seen that over the last, particularly the last couple of years. And so when I hear, you know, when I hear uh, administrators kind of bemoaning us hard to get talent, people are leaving and so on and so forth, they're like, these folks loved higher ed, and they loved the students, higher ed didn't love them back. Mm. Um, and I think particularly for women of color, higher ed didn't love them back. And so when you see this outflow of incredibly talented uh, women leaving a space where they've given their blood, sweat, and tears, um, and leaving to go somewhere else, we can't, go, we can't throw shade and be like, oh, you, you sold out, you want to make more money. No, I loved higher ed, and higher ed didn't love me back. So I think it's um, two things, I think for higher education, um, we don't start appreciating our people. Without people, this does not work. You know, sometimes there's, there's, there's such a focus, and we're, I think we're all here because we love students, but there's such this, I think at times, narrow focus only, only on students, and not giving love to the people who are supporting this, the students. Um, and this is, I think, all higher professionals, but I think that much more so exasperated, particularly with, with women of color. So if higher education wants to continue to be successful, wants people, talented people to come and work um, in higher education, we have to take care of our, our people. And we can't rest on the laurels of the ideals of higher ed. Because I think sometimes we do that. We think that we're, um, you know, because it's higher ed, the, the, the lofty goals we have and so on and so forth, that somehow we're above the fray. And we love knocking corporate America as being this beast that only cares about money. Corporate America, I think, does a better job of taking care of its people than higher ed does. And that seems broadly. This is not, not, not any one institution. This is higher education as a system. So I think we have to do a better job and listen, um, um, listen to uh, the folks who are working here, uh, particularly the most marginalized of, of, of among us. But I also, if we, I think for, for women of color and others who are at the point where I, I can't, Know, know that it's okay to go somewhere else. It's okay to go, okay to go somewhere else where you feel valued and you feel supported and, and taken care of in that same way. And I, I would say the same. Um, you know, like those who like you, right? And so if, if you're not getting what you need, like for me, so as, a, as an investor, as a business person, I purposely and unapologetically say the first organizations that I'm looking at are women of color, particularly black women, who are doing great things at a world-class scale, 
right? Now that can be upsetting to some people, but because we can, well, because we compete in a, in a global world, right? It's not just one community. So as a business person, I want to make sure that I'm investing my time, talent, and treasure in that community, but we have to be able to compete globally, right? And I think as a person who works in business and invests, looking at it that way is important, but I always encourage my two nieces, right now we're talking about, are you interested in this? Okay, so how much money do you need to you know, bring together? Why don't you partner with your cousins if you have this idea so that you can not only have it in your own mind and incubator, but you have a group of 10, 15, I mean, they're, they're eight, right? But, but, the, but, the, but the premise is the same because I'm teaching the mindset of you have agency, right? You're not going to get from the system that was not built for you what you need from it. And so don't waste your energy on trying to kick down that door. Just build your own. And I want to show them how to do it. And so I would say the same thing from an education standpoint, because what we do know, whether it's politically, certainly economically, because we see it in a lot of other communities, where you do have a pool of resources, that's where you have power and influence. And so partner with those who like you, including myself, right? And then we drive those things forward. Sounds like there might be a connect after. Is that what I'm we had a question here, gentlemen in the black shirt, and then and we'll get to the last one after that. Thank you both. I love this conversation. I'm not sure how helpful my question is going to be, but um, the, the, there's something this week that's been on my mind, which is that when we talk about providing the resources that students need, this the sense that we're still burdening them with having to go out and find these resources. We can have brochures, we can have websites, we can have everything, but it still is incumbent upon them to have the bandwidth and the, the motivation to go and do that. And I'm struck, Torian, by your comments about AI, and sort of the sense that AI has a nefarious objective, it's marketing, it's, a, it's evaluation, it's, it's surveillance. But when we talk about needing to be where the students are, needing to be in their places, in their communities, I mean, quite frankly, the universities aren't gonna invest in the staffing that would be needed to be there at that, at that level, right? So given the way that AI can be predictive, do you see in these conversations that you're having a way of leveraging that, that sort of predictive technology to, to help identify students' needs, to, to kind of be there with them to say, you know, it sounds odd, but you know, sensing that you might need additional support, you might be going through a mental crisis, you might need financial support, you might need whatever, to be kind of an additional resource that leverages technology to be there for the students as opposed to individuals. We hear a conversation about using that in a way in education to, to, to kind of observe what students are doing and the resources that they might need. I think the technology exists. I know the technology exists. The question is, is what type of bias is built into the development of the, of the technology, right? So again, putting on my business that we need more organizations, students, people thinking around how do we create systems, curriculums, that are at the very beginning, at the roots, thinking much broader and considering broader, right? Broader communities, uh, different ways of thinking. And so I don't, I don't know if we'll solve the, the challenge that we, we, I think we're gonna have in AI until we start having it at the ground level of the technical mindset and then development at that level. Because, you know, as a, as a male, Right? There are just certain bias that I'm going to have in what I develop. And I, I know that, and as an ally of other communities, I come in with that awareness, but everyone may not have that, right? And, 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 and even though I have it, still doesn't mean I know all of my biases, I don't have blind spots. So um, I think we have to broaden that part of it first, um, and I think that's what's gonna help. And then I'll also say, going back to being a centerist, I mean, there are a lot of allies who may not necessarily come from an under represented community that candidly, and I get, I hear this a lot, they just don't know how to be a good ally and want to, but they, you know, they feel like, hey, especially in the environment right now, that they may be shunned. And so trying to find a way to create space is I think another way in which we can grow a broader community to actually move this forward, because there's an opportunity there that I think we can explore as well too. Exactly. One thing I would all add to that is I, I think we also have to allow our students to tell us what they want and they need. 
Um, I think often we look and say, okay, you know, we all, I mean, this is how things are structured. You, know, you check your first gen, your student color, your, your this, that, okay, you know, you need these resources, you need those resources. But maybe they need something that's completely different. Um, and so I think we also have to look at ways, how are we allowing our students to, to tell us what we need and then how are we lowering the barriers for them getting access to that, um, whatever, whatever that may look like. If it's, if it's AI driven or, 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 or machine learning, whatever it may be, how are we lowering, lowering the barrier for them to access, but moving away from the, the assumptions that you know, you, you, frankly, we all make at times that because you are X, you need Y. Um, allowing to say, no, I need A or I need B. And I think about like one way to do it. I was in a course once, and in this classroom, what the teacher was doing is they had the students identify their favorite YouTuber, I think it was, yeah, favorite YouTuber. And they basically reverse engineered how their channel built to where it was. And then she reached out to the YouTuber and have the YouTuber chime in with the class, right? So that case method, if you will, was kind of a real-time example of, it was relevant to her classroom. The kids learned, how do you build a YouTube channel? How do you monetize a YouTube channel? Because by the way, the top YouTuber last year made $64 million, okay, in one year. Just so you know, that, that is the future, right? And what does it take? How many hours does it take? Cameras, lighting, like, you know, the things that, because we, if from a consumer standpoint, because I'm a huge consumer of YouTube, you see the end product, but what you don't see, to use the sports analogy, are the 12 to 14 hours of free throws that have to be put up to even get the finished product. And so it was a great learning for those kids in that classroom. And then what made it real was that the person, or the YouTuber that they admired, actually chimed into their classroom. It was only for like 30 minutes. And it was one of the most, um, impactful educational experiences that I witnessed because I could see the beginning of that class, these are younger children uh, or younger kids, how they they had trepidation at first and they really didn't care to them being so excited to learning and understanding the business of how it worked and, and content creation to where it completely changed like at least three or four students that I talked to, what they wanted to even do with their life. It changed how they saw themselves in the world. So that's just a small example of you know maybe a, a way to meet meet whatever your student population is where they are, and then try to make it relevant and impactful for them. Thank you both so much for this conversation. It's really interesting. Um, so I work at the University of Florida. I'm an international center now, but I used to teach there, and I taught Spanish. So I hit a lot of students from a lot of different majors. Um, one thing I noticed during the pandemic was that my students who had existing privilege navigated failure during the pandemic easier than my students who didn't. As an example, a student who couldn't afford a laptop. My department required for Zoom cameras to be on. So the student has to drop the class, required for the major, they're set back. If we're gonna circle back to um, that idea of failure, if you fail often, you fail a lot, et cetera, the relationship you have to failure can be conditioned by your identity. So yep. for our most vulnerable students, if there's gonna be an incubator, you can fail, you can fail. I really like that idea, Jorian, that you just mentioned of the case study with YouTube and how that worked out. If there is a student who can't afford a laptop, you're gonna have a similar case study at a university, and it's international, so it's not a YouTuber from US, it's a YouTuber from Ghana. Yep. The students who can't afford the resources, how do we make sure as educators, I guess, or is there a way that you all can envision tech ameliorating, mitigating some of those things? Because that would be the, if I were a student, I had this incubator, it's great, went to this class, after the class, I go to the center, I wanna continue building my own YouTube now. I don't have the webcam, my lighting is off, I don't have, I can't get to campus because I don't have a car, and maybe I'm not in a location where it's so easy to get there. I'm gonna drop out of the incubator, I'm not gonna be a part of it. And then you're gonna have the students again who are the most, who have the most access, reaping the most benefit. So I guess, how do you consider that in the realm of tech? Is there anything tech can do to kind of help education to mitigate some of those problems? Because that's what I would perceive based off my experience. Right, that's a great question, that's a great question. Um, I would start with, are we using the right tools? So let me go to your specific example. 
Um, the lap laptops are not the future. I would argue that a lot of students probably have a phone though. Not all, but a lot, right? And so the, the whole premise of that is, is basically we just kind of have to start where we are. Because I understand what you're saying, right? It took me, if I think about from a career standpoint, there were two things that really changed my life. I had to learn how to receive feedback without me feeling like it was a personal attack. And that came from my background and my upbringing and my home. Um, and then also from a leadership and executive leadership standpoint, I had to learn how to delegate because part of my success in getting over the, the not learning how to have feedback is I'm just gonna push and muscle my way through and I'm gonna do everything. And that doesn't work, right? I would argue that someone like, a, I'm not gonna say their name, um, a, a big tech CEO, you know, they're not trying to do everything and delegate it out, right? So in that particular situation, I would say, you know, just, it's gonna be one off in really assessing where you are, but really trying to utilize the best resources that you have. I mean, I think we all know in the work that we do, we, it's, as much as we want to include, it's very difficult to get to everything for everybody, but at least being able to frame those three, four to five things that are most relevant to the community that we're working in and trying to serve, and then trying to aggregate as much inclusion into that is, is, is really gonna be important. But you're right, I mean, it's, it's a very difficult, ta uh, difficult task when you start to talk about the, the gap between access, I mean, even high-speed internet, right? Is, I mean, we're, we're moving into 6G will be here, right? We're moving into web 3.0. You know, that's gonna really create in rural environments as well as poor urban environments, a disparity uh, between the two as well. What I would add to that is, I think, is for, for higher education, as again, we know te technology is here, it's going to stay here, it's part of the future. Um, how are we investing in our, in our students? So, the kind of investments we were making to make sure students had everything they needed in the 2000s needed to look different in the 2010s and needs to look different in the 2020s and the 2030s. So, now maybe we're, maybe we see institutions doing this at times. Hey, we're investing to make sure our students have laptops or they have iPads or whatever it might be. Definitely see it in K-12 space, but also in the higher ed space, you're starting to see it from, from that, that, that aspect. So I think for us, it's just in higher education, what does it mean to invest to make sure all, all of our students are um, successful? What is equitable access to the kind of tools or resources so that you can be successful? What does that look like? Uh, and that's gonna, take, that's gonna take investment, and I think obviously it has to be, it's gonna take investment and it's gonna take institutions appreciating where where we're going versus we've always done things this way, so we're just gonna keep investing in, in the same thing. We gotta invest in the future from that aspect. The other thing that I was saying is, um, I think you brought up a, a great point. Um, I'm very comfortable saying, that Victoria as well, fell fast, fell often, fell fast, fell often. Um, I've had a support group around me for my entire life, my, you know, my, my family, friends, and so on and so forth where failure was positioned as a, as a positive thing, or this is a development opportunity and so on and so forth. So I think we, uh, in, it, depending on the space that we're in, the concept may be the same, fail fast, fail often, but how we articulate and how we position it may need to change so that um, populations who have told, been told that you're gonna fail in, in a negative connotation are looking at this as, okay, this is something negative, but no, this is something positive. Um, so how do we uh, articulate it? Again, the thing of the population we're talking about, they're articulated in a way that we're not taking something that we want to be positive, but we're reinforcing narratives that historically marginalized populations have, have heard their entire lives. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, and I, I, I did not come from that. I had to learn that the failure part. I mean, I, I don't, I'm being honest because, you know, without getting too deep into the family history, that was not there for me. It was, go, you know, go to school, be a good student, and I wasn't, you know, I was marginal. Um, got in a lot of trouble and all that stuff. But, but I had people, probably likely like yourself, who really helped build some level of agency, but then also held me accountable and responsible too. And I had to grow into that. And, and ultimately in that learning, it, it really kind of helped. Um, and I think that's where the, it's probably everyone in this room knows, the mentorship, the one-on-one -on -one connection, be, being able to care enough to confront is important. But you know, even in those situations, as we know, that can be received differently depending on the on the background that you come from. You know, there's 
you know, levels of abuse or anything like that. So um, I think ultimately it's just, you know, there isn't one answer. It's, it's the answer for where we are. And, and I always go back to the framework and the model of how are we framing this? How are we, how are we framing it in a way in which we can have those larger buckets, whether it be the, the skills, the values, the attributes, right? Um, how do we take that international education and just frame it so that it works for this student and that student, and then they can make some part of it their own, that hopefully, with intentionality, that they take with them into, into other areas. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists one more time for your comments. The questions were really solid. Thank you all. And I'm looking forward to the next 10 years. What was it, 50 years, I'm saying that you said? <laughs> that we're looking ahead uh, for this. So thank you so much. Um, just as a reminder, we will.